Привет всем! And welcome to my show, where I use my favorite and nostalgic Soviet movies as an illustration and pretext to talk about the real life of ordinary Soviet people and these aspects that shaped us into the nations and countries that we are now. This is the third and final episode dedicated to the brilliant slapstick comedy Operation Y and Shurik's other adventures by Leonid Gaidai. And while in my previous videos, which covered said other adventures, we first had to deal with corporal punishment and bullying, then enjoyed a brief uh, respite in the form of academic dishonesty and partial nudity, now it's time to strap in for Operation Y itself and heavier stuff, namely breaking, entering and corruption. So are you ready? Then like for luck and let's go. I'm Katya, and this is Soviet Movies Explained. As always, this novella features Shurik, a stereotypical nerdy student, but this time his show is stolen by three guest stars, or rather, guest characters, whom those of you who have watched my recent Spotlight video might recognize as the coward, the fool, and the pro. They were invented by Leonid Gaidai as a Soviet take on the Three Stooges and first introduced as his homage to the silent film slapstick comedies The Short, Dog Barbos and The Unusual Cross. This trio of petty criminals became so insanely popular that Gaidai had to write them in his latest project. He lifted his story from a news article about a ruse, where an embezzling warehouse manager who failed to bribe the upcoming auditor Staged a mock robbery in order to mask his pilfering. That's exactly what our group of hapless crooks is hired to do. And is stopped naturally by Shurik, who accidentally happened to substitute the regular frail watchwoman. So this is why this uh, action or, uh, to put it better, Operation. Operation. Почему? Эй, чтобы никто не догадался. Well, okay. That's why the last novella and the entire movie is called Operation E. And yes, it is pronounced neither Y nor Y, but. Thank you. After one of the scariest vowels in the Russian alphabet. Alternately, we called Yeri and bestowed with this intimidating phonetic symbol, the letter U is an integral part of our language and of some famous people's names. Krylov, Ivan Grozny, Budyonny. And if you want to master its pronunciation, you can follow this advice that I lifted from the expenses of the internet. You start with the long sound U, like in Uber, U, continue ooing and then stretch your lips in a wide smile. U, and allegedly something akin to a Russian sound E or a satisfied grunt of the caveman should come out. Please report how you fared in the comments and I'll go straight to pointing out the curious bits in the movie and providing a somewhat relevant comments on them. The story begins at a market where the trio is immediately established at somewhat shady figures. The wares that they sell are extremely kitsch and low quality. The coward advertises his postures as being not abstract. This is a reference to an anecdotal visit to an abstract art exhibition by the party head Nikita Khrushchev in 1962. He swore colorfully at the paintings and bashed their creators for using people's money to create some dope rubbish. This resulted in those painters being kicked out from the artists' union, effectively cutting off their financing, and a general setback for the genre in the country for many years to come. Here we see a familiar face interested in the not-abstract art. Why it is further the bore from the first novella? Not sure how well the Shurik's lessons stuck, 
but at least he's sober, although a sack of empty bottles might be from wine as well as lemonade. The market scene contains a little bit of social commentary. While there was a ban on private enterprise in the Soviet Union, shortly before the film's release, it became allowed to sell small amounts of self-grown, self-gathered or self-made produce at such markets. This was mainly done to provide some financial relief to ever-struggling peasants. But the lucky owners of small land plots, duchess, also made use of that as well as artisans of varied skills. The crude and tasteless creations showcased in this market are a jab at such unscrupulous entrepreneurs. Anyway, for our free comrades, this is just a front business. While the brain and the muscle of the group, the pro, secures them different shady gigs. They drive in a comically small and slow vehicle, which in fact is a microcar granted exclusively to disabled people. <laughs> the police were to control the misuse, that's why for the job the crooks snap a diplomatic license plate on. By the way, there's actually ice underneath the car. The pro is sure mighty, but no matter how mini, the car still weighs half a ton. When being briefed about the job, the coward keeps checking something in a thin brochure and calling out odd numbers. The book is actually a copy of Criminal Code, and he's citing the number of years in prison they might get for their... operation. <laughs> The annoyed warehouse manager placates the coward by demoting breaking and entering up to six years and robbery up to three years to mere minor hooliganism. The song in the movie is an authentic piece of prison folklore, a prime example of Blatnaya Pesnya or Chanson. Sorry, French guys, but in Russia it is the hardships of the prison life that gets romanticized under this name. The son is about a guy whom a train takes away to a remote colony and he reflects what and when went wrong with his life and whether it is still possible to turn it around. It was the first time that such a piece was performed in the movie and many notorious criminals claimed authorship. However, the last verse where the guy swears to break out of prison and be free again, was conveniently cut. The full suggestion to train on cats became a popular catchphrase, and although no real cats were involved in this particular scenario, there is an unconfirmed reference to cats being used to test out poisonous gases during World War I. I can only hope that no cats were harmed during the making of this motion picture. Although, after a second thought, I have my doubts. And cannot vouch for the well-being of this mouse either. By the way, the art council disliked it too and asked to remove the mouse, to no avail. Meanwhile, we continue to glean small details about Shurik's circumstances. We already know that he's a tech student who most likely came to study from afar and has to work part-time at a construction site. Now we know why he needs the extra money to rent a flat from a private person, who coincidentally is the warehouse watchwoman. This means that he didn't get a place in the dorm. The capacity of those was always limited and preference was given to the best students. That means that either Shurik's grades are not that great or his speciality was extremely popular, like rocket science, and had high competition. This gesture in Russian is called figa, shish, kukish or dula and originated in Roman Empire as a complete equivalent of their modern middle finger, and still retained its obscene meaning in China, Korea, Japan and Turkey, while in Russia it has transformed into something a bit less insulting, a rude way to deny someone's request, like in this case. Shurik tells the fool to surrender a gets a defiant figure instead of a reply, 
Sometimes it can be accompanied with nakasi vikusi, which roughly translates into bite that. The word figa and its alternatives have long ingrained themselves into Russian language and, though slightly vulgar, are completely acceptable in an informal conversation. For example, to say у меня нифига нет instead of у меня ничего нет is a slightly more colloquial and emotional way to say I have nothing. Figna means bullshit or rubbish and the saying с фигой в кармане with a fig in a pocket means that someone is telling lies or makes promises that he or she has no intention of keeping, akin to having fingers crossed behind one's back. Regarding this episode, I've read an article where it was presented as the Soviet state acknowledging the repressions and imprisonment of its own people. Well, although Soviet film directors were pretty good at concealing grave topics under comedic facades, in this case, it's pure overanalyzing. The entire episode was improvised on the spot by Yuri Nikulin, the actor who portrays the fool and actually is a professional circus clown. The criminals are apprehended and Shurik is yet again kinda victorious and there ends the movie, but not the characters. The likable student immediately joined the trio in the pantheon of public's most beloved characters, which called for even more movies with them. Gaidai reluctantly surrendered and two years later kidnapping Caucasian style or Shurik's new adventures came out. The sequel sort of existed in an alternative universe, since there Shurik studies linguistics and doesn't recognize the three crooks upon meeting them again. That movie is great too, and I'll definitely do a Soviet Movies Explained episode on it, but perhaps next summer. The director's relationship with one of the actors from the trio, which wasn't sunny from the beginning, soured completely during the last shooting and Gaidai firmly divorced himself from these characters. But, since no copyright and trademarking existed in the Soviet Union, other directors were up for grabs, and The Coward, The Fool and The Pro made several episodic appearances in their films, and even were turned into an animated band of robbers in the extremely popular musical adaptation of the Bremen town musicians. As for Shurik, Gaidai later made one more movie with him. Ivan Vasilievich Back to the Future, which is in my pipeline too, and which ends one more alternative storyline to the Shurik's cinematic multiverse. But the character really hindered the career of the actor, Alexander Demyaninka, and up to the untimely end of his life, he was firmly associated with his depiction of the clumsy student and had to tolerate their nickname Shurik. The fact that he and the character shared the name didn't help either. By the way, it was a pure coincidence. In the early drafts, the student was called Vladik. But my most dedicated watchers might guess why it was no good. Vladik was an amenative form of Ivo Vladimir, making Lenin his namesake or of Vladilen, which combines Lenin's full name into an acronym. Anyway, the officials deemed their protagonist's adventures too flimsy to share the name with their father of the revolution and demanded to have it changed. And that concludes my three-part review of the Operation Y and Shurik's other adventures. If you followed my prompts and watched the film every time I asked you to, then you must know it by heart already. If not, what are you waiting for? The film is brilliant and my explanation is complete, so now you are perfectly equipped to enjoy it to the fullest. Just follow the links in the description. I already have something completely new planned for my shorter videos. As for my big episode, it intimidates me a bit, since by many it is considered one of the best depictions of the Soviet reality in its late period of stagnation and compared to the classical masterpiece The Twelve Angry Men. You are free to drop your guesses of which movie it might be in the comments, the audio clue is yet to follow. Like this video, subscribe to the channel to be notified when the next one comes out. Bye! Простите, вы еще горько пожалеете обо мне. Я добьюсь, что магистраль перенесут, она пройдет по вашему участку.
А частные гаражи мы снесем, как уродующее лицо города. И по этому месту будут мчаться автобусы и троллейбусы. Смотрите, она так могла попасть в глаз. 